the recoil system is a hydro pneumatic recoil system, meaning it uses like a shock oil absorber whenever it goes backwards, and then it uses nitrogen pressure to um, push the gun forward back into battery. The Germans worked out that with only a millimeter of difference, the Pac-40 75 millimeter projectile was suitable to be fired out of this gun. World War II German FK-288R Cut World War II German PAC-36R Cut World War II German PAC-39R Cut World War II Russian ZIS-3 Cut It's gonna be one of those, so let's find out. Welcome to the channel. We're here with our good friend Danger Bob again. <laughs> Uh, this video is essentially sponsored by Bob. Uh, Bob owns this gun and he's going to talk to us about uh, how it works, uh, how he came across it and why he decided to uh, make it in this configuration and then we're going to go shoot it. It was purchased in 2020 right at prime time pandemic. Mm. Um, it, it's not really that I picked it. It's kind of that it picked me. Uh, a, a friend of mine had found it um, in a small want ads, um, you know, like the quarter new, uh, newspaper articles that you get in small towns. And he had told me it was available. I made a few phone calls um, and purchased it sight unseen. Um, went and picked it up uh, very shortly after. And then the restoration process kind of began on it. Um, it was in a lot worse condition than I initially hoped it would be in. Uh, but the nice part about it was it had been sitting out in the desert and uh, there was no rust on it. So that was a big plus on things. So what kind of work did you have to do on it to get it shooting? Um, it, it was a complete rip the entire gun down. Um, a lot of uh, parts had to be manufactured. Uh, breech parts, uh, uh, block had to be completely manufactured. Um, the recoil system was uh, destroyed. Um, so that had to all be rebuilt as well. It was a ZIS-3 when you first got it, right? Yeah, so the gun is a, <clears throat> or is, is officially a ZIS-3 Russian gun. As far as I know, um, it's the only live firing gun in the country. And that's a hard thing to say because I don't know what some guy in, you know, Michigan um, may have one stashed away. I just, I'm around these things a lot and I have never seen another one. That's and cool. if I did find another one, I'd love to talk to the guys so we can kind of compare notes and uh, um, um, go over things. All right, if you know where one is, <laughs> let us know. Um, so why the, the German modification? What's, what brought that about? Well, the, the, the gun itself, um, in, in, I mean, it's a really, really, really good gun. And the Russians loved them. Um, the Germans loved them. Um, it, it's just a very well-made gun howitzer. And we talk about gun howitzer, it's a gun that we can elevate it almost up, you know, straight up in the air and lob um, projectiles long distances, or we can direct fire it. Um, most anti-tank guns of the era or uh, cannons were all direct fire only and didn't have much elevation. Or this thing, we can fire round huge ranges or directly fire them into the side of the mountain. And th th whenever the Germans um, captured them, um, they instantly liked them and made them their own, even producing ammunition for them. So it was actually said that I believe it was the Krupp company, the, uh, one of the head guys of the Krupp company studied uh, captured guns from, from Britain, France, all over, uh, including Russian. And whilst he was German and a German designer of Krupp guns, he actually said that the Zist 3 platform was one of the best guns of World War II. So. And, and, and that's exactly it. And no, and no one really knows about them because you know we're Americans and we don't really see the, the guns overseas. Um, but this particular gun used during World War II and still in service today, um, it, it's a lot like our M2s or our 1911s that have been in service for you know almost 100 years. And granted, it's not like this is a in-service, in-service gun, uh, but it's still being used by a lot of uh, probably overseas right now and some of the by some of the smaller armies. So um, talk about briefly you've done the pac 40 restoration um talk about comparing that to uh 
knowing that this was a stopgap gun while the Germans were waiting for the Pac-40, what differences do you see from the Pac-40 to this gun? So the, the biggest difference is with the Pac-40, and people always uh, um, say it, that the Germans are overcomplicate everything. And with this gun, all your tolerances are a whole lot lighter, um, where with the German Pac-40, the tolerances on it were exactly everywhere. And we're trying to restore a gun that's, uh, you know, 70 years old, that's been out uh, in the weather, that has perfect tolerances. It is really hard to get things apart. Um, everything seems to be breaking on them. It's just, it's a lot of work. Where the German, or the Russian stuff, the tolerances were, when I mean, you know, get the Russian tolerances, uh, where everything was pretty easy. Um, it seems that the Russian stuff comes apart a lot easier. Um, the one downside is the Russians used a lot milder steel on things. So things like bolts and nuts and uh, will it, it break off if you uh, try to put any type of torque on them. But like everything, it's once you, you spend more time getting broken bolts out of the gun than you do doing anything else. And, uh, um, but then you just go to your Ace Hardware or, or, well, or McMaster car and order new bolts and you're back in business. So that is way simpler. The whole design is way simpler as well. The breech mechanism is simpler. The trigger mechanism is simpler. Everything on this gun is made substantially simpler than the Pac-40. So we're gonna get into uh, kind of how this gun works. So start with the muzzle brake. Like what, what does, for people who are new to artillery, what does this do? And how is this compared to a lot of the other muzzle brakes out there? Well, the, Muzzle brake, it, it basically reduces probably 40% recoil on the gun. So with this one, we have a relatively short barrel and a muzzle brake. Um, and I say 40% is depending on muzzle brakes anywhere from 10% uh, all the way up to 60%, but so uh, uh, about 40% less recoil that you would normally have. Um, the recoil system is a hydro pneumatic recoil system, meaning it uses like a shock oil absorber whenever it goes backwards and then it uses nitrogen pressure to um, push the gun forward back into battery. So let's talk about that real quick, the nitrogen aspect. A lot of people hear there's nitrogen in a gun, but they don't really know what that means. So essentially, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about when the gun's relaxed and, it, and in this current position, there's a chamber with pressurized nitrogen, but when that gun recoils, that chamber compresses air and it needs to relax itself. Exactly, and then so the nitrogen is compressed and uh, then it uses that compressed air to push the gun back in and back into battery. Like a giant spring, but with nitrogen. Right here is our elevation gear. Right here is our traverse gear. Um, this right here is our trigger. And as you can see, it's a direct linkage that goes from here to a button on the block that fires it unlike the German gun, which has about three different linkages in between the two. This one is as simple as you can get, very similar to like the US 57. Um, we probably copied some parts of it when we built that gun. Um, this over here is our, what we would use to drop the block and load it. Once the round is placed in, um, it pushes the extractors back, allowing the block to drop. So typically with the firing cycle of this gun, um, the gun recoils um, all the way back here to its full recoil. And then once it reaches um, back into, there's actually a nifty little, right about here, this will trip the, um, um, the block to drop. And once the block drops, it typically will fling out the shells. And then the gun is left in this operation ready for a, another round to be quickly placed in. It's actually a semi-automatic operation uh, where the, the block is ready to go and to where the next round will be quickly placed in there and, and uh, fired. So initially when the uh, Russians went into development of the ZIS-3, um, the lead engineer for the, all the Soviet artillery uh, was very against uh, new change to their system. Uh, initially, he had heard German propaganda about German tanks being really heavily armored and that a light artillery piece was unable to penetrate the armor. Uh, as the war went on, uh, it was found that even Dushika, uh, early models of that, could actually penetrate some of the German armor. Uh, so therefore, uh, Graben, who was one of the designers of the, or the main designer of the ZIS-3, so Graben took it into his own hands to develop the uh, ZIS-3 because he saw the need for it. Um, 
even though he was receiving pushback. But uh, interesting fact about that is is that uh, initially the lead artillery chief uh, had a bunch of weapons on display, and then Stalin came and visited. Uh, and Graben was not supposed to have displayed the ZIS-3. Uh, however, he did drag it out of its storage area and put it in line of where Stalin would walk by. Uh, and Stalin actually was walking by and saw it off to the corner. And he actually veered off from his original course and went over and inspected the ZIS-3. And he called it a masterpiece. Uh, of the time, he said that this is a very like well thought out designed weapon system particularly for artillery. Uh, and at that point, it was noted that the current Marshal Kulik, uh, who is the lead artillery chief, uh, that he was inept, so they decided to put Graben into uh, service instead of him. Uh, and then at that point, the development of the ZIS-3 cannon uh, proceeded. Uh, it was designed off of a 76.2 millimeter gun that was off the F-22 USV. Uh, they added a brake, muzzle brake system on the end of it to reduce recoil. Uh, the kind of design of the gun was meant to be a very light, portable, but still a uh, fairly powerful weapon system. Uh, and Graben did achieve that in his development. Um, something that he succeeded at is, is that uh, he initially or initialized better production technology than the F-22 USV. Uh, so they began rolling them out on conveyor belt systems and uh, factory workers, which was often men um, that were ineligible for the draft. Uh, they would arm these factories and they actually became very skilled workers. Uh, it took three times less to produce a ZIS-3 cannon than it did the F-22 USV uh, at two thirds the cost of one. So Stalin, uh, when he inspected the uh, ZIS-3, he decided that it could have had extra protection for the crew. He said, why not add three fingers height? Uh, just that three fingers was enough to add or pretty full coverage for the crew that was arming this uh, anti-tank weapon. Over the course of production, over 103,000 of those were made. Uh, in retrospect, compared to the German, all German artillery pieces, only a roughly 100,000 of every variant of German artillery was made versus this one single one had over 100,000 of them. Uh, this was eventually replaced by the D44, but it was found to be uh, too heavy uh, compared to this. This was easy for Soviet soldiers at the time to mount on the back of one lease Jeeps and stuff like that. Uh, there's even uh, videos and pictures of these being towed by horses. Uh, so it was a very light, reliable, uh, an accurate weapon system for the time and then on top of that being able to cheap and mass produce it it turned out to be one of the most effective artillery pieces in world war ii uh, you will see these today um, in several modern african and asian countries where they were sold to at the time soviet allies and eventually sold to some third world countries uh, so these are being used in modern day so this is actually my first time seeing the ZIS-3 configuration. Uh, the, there is also a um, tank of sorts that has the same gun, uh, which is the PT-76. However, this is the first time I've seen an artillery piece and we are gonna go shoot it today. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then we at Restoration Passion like detailed pieces. And the fact that this has all the markings, uh, camo netting, you know, the fine little details and the fact that it's mocked up as the German uh, captured. It's pretty unique. Uh, you probably won't find very many um, examples of that behind us today. So pretty unique piece. So touching on the World War II German aspect of this gun uh, after they captured. So essentially during Operation Barbarossa in 1941-1942, uh, uh, given that the Germans were essentially waiting for delivery of the infamous Pac-40 which was their mainstay anti-tank gun of World War II. Uh, whilst it was an incredible gun, production of that gun took quite some time. And the gun actually wasn't delivered out to units in the field until uh, midway through about 1942. But uh, during the earlier phases of Operation Barbarossa, when the Germans were invading and pushing towards Moscow, uh, they noticed a distinct lack of their own um, 
field guns, anti-tank guns perhaps, available to them. So during the early phases of that operation, the Wehrmacht were actually capturing and utilizing Russian guns. And uh, this gun that you see here is a good example of uh, many of the iterations that the Germans used after they captured this gun. So the German designations for uh, artillery, you would either have the pre-designation FK or PAK. So in some instances where this might be referred to as an FK-36R, FK is the German uh, translation for a field gun. And then when you move into the, like for example, PAK-36R, it's more or less uh, in some ways the same gun, but the pack is the pre-designation for an anti-tank gun. So kind of two different roles. And this gun here represents uh, various different stages of modification and development. So each iteration the Germans had of this gun, after its capture, it had a different designation. So we're gonna go through and find out through research which uh, designation this gun right here actually is. So uh, once again, the Wehrmacht captured uh, hundreds of, uh, at the time they were called the F-22 or ZIS-3. So the baseline of this gun right here was a ZIS-3. And they initially adopted these captured ZIS-3s as field guns. And during that operation, uh, before the Germans began their withdrawal, uh, the, the modifications they would have done is extremely limited, perhaps just maybe paint them. After it was decided that whilst it was useful for a field gun, it had excellent potential as an anti-tank gun. And while the Russians designed the gun as a trifecta or a field gun, and anti-tank gun, the Germans decided to um, almost limit the use of it as a field gun. Whilst they did, they wanted to move this gun more towards an anti-tank um, capability. So its initial designation, once this gun was captured and it was using the original Russian 76mm ammo, the gun was designated as FK-296R. And uh, yeah, once again, that FK-296R just uses original ammo that came with the Russians and perhaps maybe a paint job and some light modifications. So once the Germans began actually uh, more or less factory level modification of the gun, it was um, <clears throat> rebuilt and redesignated as a 7.62 PAK-36R. And the PAK-36 was more or less the same gun but the chamber was actually opened up to receive uh, the same projectile, but with a much larger case, which was almost comparable to the uh, Pac-40 case. And it was, it was a good projectile, but the Germans figured in order to be utilized the best way in an anti-tank role, that projectile needed more power behind it. So in order to achieve that, they more or less honed out the chamber in the earlier iterations to take the bigger round. So once it was rechambered to pack 36R, uh, they had to do modifications like modify the recoil system in order to take that larger recoil stroke from, from a heavier projectile. And one of the things the Germans did to some of the Russian guns was uh, the position of the traverse and elevation wheels was not exactly ideal for an anti-tank roll. So in order to achieve a better anti-tank roll, the Germans did two things. They decided that the shield of the gun was essentially too high for an anti-tank roll. So they cut the shield down and they even used uh, pieces of their own uh, Pac-40 um, uh, pintle mounts to lower the shield. And then they uh, essentially reconfigured the traverse and elevation controls so the shooter could get down much lower and adopt a lower position. And the point of all of this was to make the profile of the gun and the gun crew much lower to establish better camouflage for an anti-tank purpose. So what is this here? What is that? Well, it would be the hound or um, the dog. And you have to, you have to guess that if uh, you are a um, German soldier that was given a Russian gun, you probably wouldn't give it a pretty um, German name. You would probably pretty much call it a dog. And that's what this thing is. It's a dog and it shoots um, and it's a reliable dog, but it's the dog. 
yeah, I can imagine uh, being one of these guys and you're hearing guys talk about this new cutting edge like Pack 40 gun and then you get one of these, you're going to be a little bit salty about it, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, even if it pretty much is a better gun, you're definitely going to be salty about it. So you named it the dog? Yes. All right, that's cool. <laughs> Let's see how the dog shoots. Yep. In addition to its use as an anti-tank roll, an additional 560 pieces of this uh, artillery was converted to be mounted on the German Marder 2 and Marder 3 tank destroyer tanks. And when you look at those vehicles, you can more or less recognize the shape of mainly the recoil system and the muzzle brake. So this gun was put in those tank destroyers. They were also seen in some cases on the German half tracks as well. So. Uh, these rings here are very indicative of German anti-tank gun crews and what they would do essentially with each tank kill they had they'd add an additional stripe or a ring to the barrel uh, it wasn't always done but it is it was a common practice so uh, we decided that this gun has taken out at least five uh, enemy tanks which I would make this a pretty experienced um, anti-tank gun crew so this gun was all in all for the Germans during World War II, it was a stopgap gun. So once again, uh, waiting for the Pack 40 to be delivered, uh, a lot of the Germans knew of this cutting edge anti-tank gun and the Germans just couldn't roll it out fast enough. So this gun being captured and rechambered, uh, it eventually became the stopgap anti-tank gun while the Wehrmacht was waiting for the Pack 40. Um, the very last iteration of this particular gun almost looks completely unrecognizable and it hit a point where actual uh, a Pack 40 barrel was married up to the breech ring of this gun and this gun used um, Pack 40 ammunition uh, straight out of the box so once that happened they also changed the muzzle brake and uh, Again, the, the last iteration of this gun was almost unrecognizable from its original Russian form. So what you see here is the representation of uh, factory ammo the Germans actually made for this gun. So the ammunition you see here was for the very early iterations of the initial FK-288. And it was essentially once the Germans had started using captured Russian ammunition they actually retooled some of their factories to make ammunition in the same specifications as the Russian stuff so when you look at the designations on these ammo boxes that PATR-7.62 is essentially the German designation for this original Russian ammo uh, designed for this gun and then once it was rechambered to take the same round but a larger case, the ammunition designation would have changed. This one right here, this, this particular projectile is an AP projectile that weighs about 14 pounds. Um, and some of the other projectiles we're gonna be shooting in here are a, uh, um, high explosive projectile with no high explosive in them. Um, basically just a giant hollow point. Um, and these things weigh, uh, you know, 11 pounds. So we have three pounds variance in our projectiles um, based on what we're shooting. So we'll kind of play around and see what shoots better. Um, and a lot of the time with these things is we're robbing projectiles for anywhere we can find them. Um, so sometimes we're shooting these really nice collectible ones. And other times we have some uh, relatively rough ones that look like they've been dug up out of the ocean some, at some point, but they all go down range. So the iteration of this gun that we see here today, uh, as far as we can tell, is a representation of the earliest conversions that the Germans would have done. So the, the shield has been cut down and modified to adopt that lower profile. It's been painted, uh, but it has not been rechambered to take the larger ammunition. So the best, most accurate depiction uh, nomenclature for the gun you see today is the German FK-288R. One of the interesting things to denote, uh, when the Germans rechambered, uh, essentially when the Germans modified the chamber of this barrel to take the Pack 40 ammunition, you gotta remember that this gun was originally designed as a 76 millimeter, but the German Pack 40 ammunition was a 75. 
And at the time, rather than making two separate projectiles, the Germans worked out that with only a millimeter of difference, the Pac-40 75mm projectile was suitable to be fired out of this gun. The only thing they had to do was essentially modify the drive band. Uh, the, the drive band was slightly enlarged to get a better seal through the 76mm. The Pac-39R had the ammunition from a Pac-40, so being 76mm, it was able to shoot a 75mm projectile. So today's video is uh, brought to us and sponsored by Hamilton Sons Firearms out of Arizona and Danger Bob works for them. So tell us about it. Well, it's, this is kind of what we do at Hamilton Sons Firearms is we restore these big cannons, bring them back to life, do load development on them. Um, this one just happened to be one of my private guns, uh, but it's what we do, it's what I do. Um, and it's a uh, very unique job, I guess. Okay, um, so we're gonna go and shoot this thing now and see how it goes and thanks for uh, bringing it out so we can film it. Yep, yeah, I always enjoy being out here and in fact, I probably learned some from these guys here who do a lot more research than I actually do, so. <laughs> yeah, so again, like this is probably the only footage you are going to see on YouTube, uh, modern footage of one of these guns in action, so enjoy it. Let it rip. On the way. Oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> 